Viruses, Latin for poison. They are obligate intracellular parasites, meaning that they must be inside of cells in order to sustain themselves. And they also can assemble spontaneously. They don't need an enzyme to put them together. Their proteins can just do it on their own. There are two origins as to how we got viruses and how they got on this planet. One of them is the simplified cells hypothesis. This basically, if you look at something that I've conveniently called Bobby's Law, that states that evolution strides towards energy efficiency. And uh, if you look at Richard Dawkins, uh, so I'm going to put it over here. Bobby's Law plus meme theory. The fact that all that we are in some contexts is nothing more than just DNA replicating itself, genes, ideas replicating themselves with Bobby's Law, which is the idea that evolution strides towards energy efficiency. That's just something that I made up. It's, there's not any actual law out there that's been patented. But it's a simplified cell hypothesis supports that. If you take a cell and you just simplify it to the bare necessities, all that you need you know, to be the most energy efficient way at replicating that genome, well, that's what a virus is. It's just a protein coat with some DNA or an RNA in it. And an example of that we have of proof of this is that the satellite cells, or satellite cells, not the same thing, satellite viruses and satellite RNA, these are viruses that can't even act as viruses on their own. Mycoplasma is plasmas or bacteria that have lost their cell walls because they don't need it, because it's metabolically taxing to have it if you're not going to use it. And then another example is the Mimi virus. And yeah, this applies to both the simplified cell and to possibly to the escape genome to a lesser extent. But that what this is, is just this is a huge, I'm just going to say a very large virus. And it's it looks like it was once a cell. If you take some stuff out and leave it as just nothing but a membrane with a genome in it, that's what you would have. Now another, I guess, hypothesis as to where viruses came from is the escaped genome hypothesis. Um, and again, all that this is, is if you take... We have vesicles going, moving in and about. We have genomes moving in and about. It's not, you know, too crazy to think that at some point along that line that there was a vesicle with a genome inside of it that started making proteins, encapsulating it, and then giving it those glycoproteins, and voila, you have a virus. We can see examples of this, such as in transposons and retrotransposons, specifically the fact that these two elements here are coding for things that you're going to see in a lot of viral genomes, which is very, very small. Also, um, the fact that vessels can form, vesicles, sorry, can form spontaneously, and in plasmids, bacteria are moving them from one to the next. It's not too crazy to think that during that, plus a lot of the membrane enfolding that they had, that something could have formed from that. So, cool. All right, now let's go into, I get some, some detail on the morphology, on the structure of them. There's helical, which is, uh, I'm so sorry. The coiled type of a cylindrical shape, this isn't really the best picture here, but I like it because it shows how you can see the RNA structure inside of these protein subunits. So let's just kind of draw that. That's the RNA there, and that helps keep that RNA stable and in place. What would be an example of this? Well, the tobacco mosaic virus, which was the first ever virus that we ever discovered, uh, is a helical virus. We also have the enveloped virus, and these are usually, uh, I guess, sometimes colloquially referred to as animal viruses animal viruses because they're good at infecting animals like you and I because well where they came from is animals they have a, a plasma membrane or a phospholipid bilayer or whatever you want to call it but it's not necessarily you can't term it a membrane some people make the distinction and I'm going to that it's an envelope because a membrane would imply that it's something is living viruses aren't living so we call it an envelope but it does the same thing keeps polar molecules out and things like that it has a couple of ion channels here and some glycoproteins to give uh, some host compatibility. We'll go into more detail on that later. Also, there is the icosahedral uh, viruses, which I think are the scariest looking. And what they are is just a mini-sided polygon. So, like this would be an example. This is the adenovirus. Put it, write that down here. Adenovirus, and this is the virus that causes pneumonia. And I always thought that it was really kind of scary because it has these these little outpoachings here. These are the glycoproteins that help determine its host range, which we'll talk about later. But just for fun facts. Now, you can also take, say, I take the helical structure here, and I combine that with an icoxahedral, and what I have here is something called a phage virus. Phage virus. And what this is, is this is a virus that infects bacteria. So it infects bacteria. Bacteria only. Um, usually, if you look on how it does this, these little 
I guess, uh, filamentous fibers here in the end are compatible with the lipopolysaccharides um, or the, you know, certain types of acids on the exterior of the bacterial cell. And whenever it binds to that, it undergoes a conformational change. We'll go into more detail on that later, but just know that they can infect bacteria and they only infect bacteria. So in places like Europe, we're starting to use these things to not only act as vectors for uh, genetic engineering, but we're also using them for treating uh, really bad bacterial infections because they can adapt along with that bacteria that keeps adapting. So one of the things that I guess I should probably draw up here that we're still talking about is with phage viruses is that they can infect bacteria. And the two ways that two things that can happen whenever a phage virus, any phage virus, um, T, I should probably just say anything that's T even, Anytime one of these things infects a bacteria, one of two things is going to happen. 90% of the time, you're going to have this right here, the lytic, the lytic cycle. So let's just kind of break this down for a second. So first thing we have is attachment. And these are the, the filamentous structures here. Again, are compatible with the lipopolysaccharides if the bacterium is gram-negative or any type of the uh, um, outer acids. Outer, um, I'm just saying any of the outer structures structures. Okay, so once it attaches to that, once it binds to that, that's going to cause a conformational change and it's going to inject uh, a lot of its viral DNA in this context. Then once it's going to inject a lot of that viral DNA, it's going to start uh, having some enzymes that are going to lyse up and destroy any of the bacterial chromosome that was there. So the only type of DNA that's going to be in there is a viral DNA. And once what do you know, uh, RNA polymerases do is they read that. They read it, they start making messenger RNA. That messenger RNA codes for proteins, which helps make all the new subunits and parts of a virus. Now, remember, they spontaneously assemble. They don't need an enzyme to catalyze the reaction that, form aids, that forms them, which I, I really can't comprehend that, but they do. And eventually they'll have so many of them inside of that the actual cell will just burst and it will ends in lysis, which is why it is called the lytic cycle. So this kills bacteria. What does it do for the virus though? It gives it multiple copies of it using the bacteria's uh, own machinery to do so. So, kind of crazy. Another thing that they have is the lysogenic uh, cycle. So the something is genic, meaning it has a generator, it has the potential to become lytic. And what happens is the exact same thing that would have happened in the others. I don't really know why I didn't include the tail fibers here, but they bind to the lipopolysaccharides or anything on the exterior that is capable of causing a conformational change. And then once that happens, the DNA of the phage virus is going to be inserted into the bacterial uh, cell. And uh, what it will do is not only will it uh, circularize itself, as you can see here, which is, I guess, a general trend that you may want to notice when we talked about plasmids or episomes. So just keep that in mind. And then certain factors can determine whether or not it's going to be lytic or lysogenic. But let's just say that it's going to be lysogenic for the purposes of this. So it integrates itself into the bacterial host chromosome. It's in the form of something called a prophage. I should probably use a different color to highlight that. So a piece of viral DNA that is inside of a bacterial chromosome we call a prophage. And then it just what it does is it's, it's not really transcriptionally active. It just stays there. And as the bacterium will replicate its DNA, well, it's going to replicate that prophage DNA along with it. It doesn't really have any means of telling which the difference between the two. And this is really rare. You're only going to see this in about 10% of all the phage viruses that we know of. But what this is, is it provides it a way of avoiding being destroyed by the host and being able to replicate its DNA. So let's just say that this um, you know, bacterium is around here and it gets exposed to something, some type of a environmental stress, like say UV rays. Okay, so UV rays come in and they hit this bacterial chromosome. Well, what that does is it's going to remove the repressor protein that is preventing that from being transcriptionally active. Because remember, bacteria have 100% exonic DNA. So every single piece of DNA in a bacterium is going to be transcribed to form a gene. But with this prophage that we have in there, it keeps it from being activated. It's constantly under repression. So once something that is damaging to the DNA happens, well, you're going to have a removal of that repressor protein, along with whenever the you know, bacterial um, 
nucleases or replication or repair enzymes come into play, they're going to remove that repressor protein. Now that that repressor protein's been removed, this prophage is becoming transcriptionally active. And if we're transcriptionally activating a prophage, we go into the lytic cycle, which is exactly what we talked about before. Virus viral proteins get replicated, the host genome gets degraded. There's nothing there but the viral genome. And then the whole cycle happens again. It bursts, ruptures, releases more uh, viral copies, and can go on and infect other bacterial cells.